folks, meet Kevin is a force of nature. He is someone who's gone on to build a seven figure following on YouTube, social media. He ran for governor in California. He now has a house hacking business that he is running and all kinds of amazing things. But I want to highlight meet Kevin's interview on one rental at a time where he talked about the beginning, his origin, him and his wife doing a 203k loan and many other things. Let's take a look at meet Kevin before meet Kevin blew up. Hey everyone. Uh, I have a uh, really interesting show for you today. It's actually something that I put out on Facebook about three weeks ago, trying to work my network going, who can help me make this happen? And uh, sure enough, um, you know, connections were made and we have Meet Kevin from YouTube fame uh, with us today. How are you doing today, Kevin? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, this, this is going to be fun. So one question I've been dying to ask you is, when did real estate become your thing? I, I, I've heard your videos. I've heard your story before, but it, it never really clicked for me where you're like, you know what? Buy and hold rentals or being an investor is, is the way I want to go. Yeah, it was probably back at, when I was in high school, my uh, girlfriend at the time, I was living with her and her parents, uh, decided, oh, she was going to get a real estate license. And, and that's because her father was just getting ready to retire from real estate. Uh, and I thought, real estate license, uh, I, I don't know, that's not my thing. I want to go corporate. I want to do corporate world. Well, after she had been doing it, and every time I'd pass her studying, I'd realize like, that seems pretty easy. And I'm hearing these scenarios or whatever. I'm like, I'll check that out. You know, what else? I'm doing high school stuff. Why not? And, and so that's actually where I first got excited about real estate. And when I started hearing the stories of all of these clients that my father-in-law, now father-in-law had of people who started with houses and, and are now living financially free thanks to their rental income by buying one rental at a time, I'm like, huh, that seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> Wow, I, I didn't. I, I don't know if you've shared that story before. If so, I, I it's one of the videos I missed. Um, I, a, it's got to be interesting living with your girlfriend in high school with her parents. I'm sure that was interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was mostly because had I see they were they were pretty smart in that. I was living in Florida at the time and they realized, uh oh, Laura and my wife now might move out to Florida. And they're oh, like, well, how can wow. we prevent Lauren from leaving? Let's just invite Kevin here. <laughs> I got it. Well, good for them. They had, they had foresight in planning and clearly liked you. They wanted to keep you around. So uh, that's awesome. And then your father-in-law, through his stories and his relationships, give you that kind of introduction, right? They say, hey, you know, client A, client B, client C, and you start hearing these stories as a teenager, um, I can only imagine kind of how that launched you going forward, right? It's, it's yeah, and at the time, it was just the start of the recession too. You know, I really got, started getting interested in this uh, around the beginning of 2009. So that's, you know, right as home values are plummeting and, and sort of starting to bottom out at the end of 2009, 2010, we're starting to see this bottoming out. And, and we, we're running numbers and we're practicing these scenarios are of, okay, well, what if you bought a house for 20% down and then you went over here and you borrowed the 20% from Bob and you paid interest on both of those loans and then you turned around and rented it out and then you have a positive cash flow. That's how the numbers lined up back then. I'm like, this really is a no brainer. Obviously the numbers aren't as beautiful anymore today, but yeah. it certainly got me started. Well, that, you, you know, kudos to you for taking that shot. Cause you know, I invested pre crash and after, mm -hmm. um, lots of people had the opportunity in 09. I mean, because the deals were everywhere. I mean, literally in the MLS, right? Capital letters, any offer accepted. Exactly. Of so what do you think, how do you think you had the, I mean, you were a teenager or at least early 20s, you had the guts to pull the trigger because you've always been in California investor, right? So these are hundreds of thousands of dollars you're, you're looking at buying. Yeah, I mean, I, I was working at Jamba Juice and I had, uh, you know, maybe six or $7,000 to my name. And the first place I bought was $300,000. And I bought that with my wife, Lauren, and it was a fixer at that. Uh, and I, I think really what got me to pull the trigger was not only those stories and the beliefs and seeing other people succeed, but also, uh, well, twofold. One, I knew that worst case, if 
something went wrong, we could always rent the house out and we felt like we were getting a good deal to where we were hoping we could sell it if we needed to. That was a safety net. But if all that failed, the second thing that I always have in the back of my mind is, hey, well, if everything doesn't work out, I could always go file bankruptcy and I guess I'll just, you know, start over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. you're, you're in your early 20s or late teens and you're like, oh, if that's the worst case scenario, take your shot, right? Yeah, it's like, I'm not going to go to jail. What do I got to lose? I don't have anything to lose. <laughs> so let's remind everybody about that $300,000 house. It was in what city, kind of the single story, 1,300 square foot. What, what was it? Yeah, three and two, 1,333 square feet. It was a place that I actually bought uh, with three and a half percent down using an FHA loan. Uh, we did the renovation loan portion of that, uh, the two or three K and renovated it uh, within a year of having bought it and fixed it up. Maybe we were into the deal with fix up and everything for somewhere around 380. Within a year, the place was worth like 475. And we're like, wow, <laughs> you know, here I was working my butt off at Jamba Juice for a year. And I was, I managed to collect $6,000 and a beach cruiser bike that I spent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and and then you, you realize what real estate can do for you. And it's like, whoa, that's way faster. <laughs> you know, people are always like, oh, meet Kevin. Yeah, he's that buy and hold long-term appreciation guy. And I'm like, well, that's certainly not how I started at least. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, some is good, more is better, right? I mean, that's yeah. But again, there's nothing about your story that anybody watching, you had an FHA loan, 3.5% down. You did yeah. a 203K for the repair money. Yeah. Those are available today, right? Exactly. Right. And again, Jamba Juice, right? So, you know, sounds like, you know, well, unemployment's under 4%. So, you know, most people have jobs. Um, and again, so where do you go from there, right? So you have your first one. It's owner occupied, obviously, at this point. Where, where do you, where's the second one coming? What's the distance between those? Yeah, so the second one, the first one we closed uh, at the end of 2012. It ended up being a six-month escrow. It was a nightmare with Bank of America at the time. They didn't have the best of reputation for doing loans. They had just absorbed Countrywide. I remember. That work. <laughs> I remember. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, after that, we ended up, uh, it was the beginning of 2013, uh, this was before we had sort of, uh, uh, you know, started looking into the, the new value of our property and things like that. But we already had a good feeling. Our renovations were done. We're like, this is this is pretty cool. We feel pretty comfortable with this. This is not as hard as we thought it was. Uh, and at the beginning of 2013, I was a brand new real estate agent as well. Well, I would say brand new. Beginning of 2013, I've been doing it now for two years as a real estate agent. So it was the beginning of my th uh, third year now as a real estate agent at 13. And I'm passing out flyers. It feels brand new because I feel like I'm doing it forever now. <laughs> I, I remember passing out flyers in a neighborhood. And I, I kept telling myself, I'm going to find one. I'm going to find one. And I wasn't actually telling myself I'm going to find a seller or a buyer, although I really wanted to find a seller or a buyer. And that's why I was passing out flyers. I kept telling myself, I'm going to find a deal I can buy this year. And it was so weird because how that actually ended up happening was I, two months later, it was maybe the beginning of March, I'm doing an open house and this person walks into the open house and says, hey, would it be weird? And it wasn't even my listing. I was holding an open house on. Somebody else's uh, let me hold an open house. Anyway, somebody walks in and says, hey, would it be weird for there to be two for sale signs up on the same street at the same time? And I'm like, huh, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, tell me more. <laughs> yeah. And so long story short, that ended up being a place we were able to buy off market uh, for $388,000. After we did a little bit of work to it, it was probably worth about five. I think we spent maybe 40K on fixing it up. And uh, here we go. There was our first first rental property. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, cool. So it's just weird how like, I just kept telling myself every day, I'm going to make it happen. And then sure enough, like the opportunities present themselves. Yeah. So again, let's, let's remind folks. So first one was 09. Second one was 2013. My math says four years. That's okay. Right. You don't have to do 17 in a year, right? Like we see some of these social media pages and, you know, people on Facebook going, Oh, I do 30, you know, three deals a month. And it doesn't have to be that way. Right. No, it, it doesn't have to be fast at all. And I may have misconveyed. I started my real estate career in 09. We didn't buy that place until the end of 11. And oh, okay. 
Fridays until late 12. Oh, okay. So it was actually 12 we ended up closing this deal, which is just crazy how, how like, it, right along the lines of what you're saying, how long it can sometimes take to like, okay, now, now I'm getting my real estate license. Now I get licensed in 2010. Now I'm excited about real estate. Okay, now I want to pull the trigger. How am I going to do it? And so you're so right. Like, it's okay to, to take your time. And for my goal was always one at a time, and if I could do it one a year, right. that's awesome. You know, it doesn't, it, you see a lot of stories online where people are like, hey, look, you know, I was able to do 10 deals this month and I'm, you know, making this much drop shipping and I'm putting it all into real estate and I just bought five places in Indianapolis. To me, it's not a realistic way to build wealth. To me, it's, yeah. you know, buy a place, live it, feel it for six months to a year. You know, the time between we closed our first and our second was about 12 months. Okay. And, and, and to me, even that felt kind of fast, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's, that's the key that I want to get with this because I see that in your channel and, and it's obviously the name of my book, White, One Rental at a Time. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be in a rush, but you've always got to be in the market, right? As you've shared, right? You're always looking for the next one. You were always learning. You were always really understanding what a good or a great deal was because again you're as an agent you were seeing hundreds of listings probably every week and most of them didn't fit your criteria I would guess yeah and, and that's exactly it is I, I always try to look at the market and say you know what the, the the biggest thing first is get the money and and save the money and be in the right position to where you're comfortable putting that three and a half percent down or that twenty percent down whatever you want to put down I don't, you know nobody has to put down three and a half percent you want to wait until twenty percent go for it right. whenever you feel ready then hunt. And, and look for what I call those wedge deals where you can get those below market opportunities. Absolutely. One of the things that we were going to talk about I have is wedge deals. Uh, I know it's important to you. So let's, let's just share what, what is a wedge deal by your definition? Absolutely. But my, to me, a wedge deal is something that's possible in almost any market I've ever looked at. And the essence is very, very simple. What you're looking for is a house that you can buy for, say, $200,000. You put maybe $20,000 of work into it, and now it's worth, say, $275,000 or $300,000, whatever. That difference in value, you know, you're into it for $220,000, 200 paid, $20,000 in fix-up or $30,000 in fix-up, whatever. You're into it for one amount. Now it's worth a lot more. That difference is what I call the wedge. And the reason that wedge exists is because... Uh, real estate, most real estate one to four is saturated by unsophisticated home buyers. It's mom and pop investors, mom and pop buyers. And most of them don't understand, except the ones that watch my YouTube channel or, you know, read the, you know, your, your book or whatever. Most people don't understand that. Wow. Wait, this stinky, nasty, hoarded nightmare of a house that has dual pane windows and a new roof and copper plumbing and a newer electrical system, but I'm not seeing those systems. I'm just seeing the stinky, nasty stuff. Most people don't realize, wow, if I just got the crap out, painted, carpeted, and cleaned it up a little bit, I'd be right back at market value. And yeah. to me, that is where you want to buy. That's where you want to put your money. Oh, there's no question. And again, uh, whether you call it wedge deals or whatever you want to call it, I'll, I'll, I'll use the idea of wedge deals. Um, the market that we are either in or, or entering where it's no longer just straight up, uh, wedge deals are more prevalent and it's because the market's inefficient, not only unsophisticated buyers, but there's also life events that make unsophisticated sellers, whether it's, you know, the yeah. heirs of their kids or they live there forever and they don't appreciate what the, what the, you know, the city around them has done. Um, and that's why the one to four market offers people who hunt again, to use your word, um, if you look hard enough, you'll find the wedge deals for sure. Um, that's exactly it. It's, it's getting out there and just looking for that, that property that has those elements we just talked about and surprise, surprise, whether it's the sellers uh, making mistakes or the competing buyers making mistakes and not seeing what you're seeing. Hey, great. <laughs> and most of the time, the best test, at least what I found to be a really good test is because I get this all the time. People are like, Oh, well, Kevin, now there are multiple offers. I don't want to get into a bidding war. And usually what I find is the good wedge deals only have offers from flippers. And 
any home buyer or anybody looking to get one rental at a time can beat a flipper because they don't have to include the future selling costs into their budget. So they can, they're, they're right there are your wedge deals. Oh, there are multiple offers. Oh good, I might be on the right track here. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, multiple offers could be a signal and you're absolutely right. Flippers uh, have to keep their machine running and they have selling costs and frankly, most of them have hard money costs because it's not their yeah. money, right, yeah. for that time frame. So um, they have costs that a owner occupant or a one investor one at a time doesn't have. So you're right, I think that is a good sign. Bingo. Uh, so, so great advice. Uh, so back to your story. You, so you go from one, you get your first rental in 2013. Where does the story continue from there? Yeah, and so right along the lines of we have our first place, now we have our second place. That was 2013. The very next property was in 2014. It was a short sale, single family house, similar, you know, super uh, hoarding, messy property, but built in the 80s and really structurally sound. Everything about it was great, felt very good about it. Problem was the listing agent listed the property as a two bedroom and it was really a three bedroom. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, money, <laughs> you know, this is a simple wedge right here. Uh, and, and so that was our uh, next purchase. And uh, ordinarily I say it's, it's easiest because both of those, you know, the 13 property and the 14 property, we bought as rental properties, which means we had to come up with the 25% down. And we did that through a combination of hard money or refinancing our first one, you know, the BRRRR method, <laughs> whatever, right? Uh, it wasn't until 2015 that we actually did what I regularly advise, which is just pack your bags and move. <laughs> and that's when we got our next one. So was that a three and a half percent down FHA loan? The, the one that we ended up uh, going into that we occupied, we did what was known as an 80-10-10 loan. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we didn't have mortgage insurance because we technically put 20% down, but we put 20% down as a combination of 10% of our money yep. and 10% as a home equity line of credit, which now, as soon as we closed, I'm like, sweet, I got a home equity line of credit. All right, he built it. <laughs> nice. And I'm guessing the first house that you packed your bags up from became your third rental. Bingo. Excellent. All right. So I we're never doing... sell. <laughs> I, I, I always, I, I, I've in my career, I've sold one of my own properties. And to this day, I regret selling that property. It was a flip and I wish I didn't sell it. I just like, keep everything because the selling costs are so high. Yeah. Even for you as a broker. Yes. Yeah. I was like so frustrated. Like what? I have to pay escrow and title and another realtor. This sucks. Meanwhile, I'm a realtor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the only thing that I would say is, I first off, totally agree. In my 15-year journey, as you'll eventually read in the book, we never sold, technically sold. However, we did exchange, right? Yeah, we did 30, 1031 exchanges. Um, still had some selling costs to commissions and, and escrows, but it allowed us to go bigger or do like kind exchanges. Have you ever looked at something like that? Yeah, I mean, exchanges are great opportunities moving one rental to another. And, and to me, that works superbly when we're looking at, okay, let's look at a duplex or a fourplex or a tenplex or apartment yeah. buildings. Or you know what? It's been a while now. We've got this single family. We've kind of got our opportunity out of that. We can capitalize on some gains, defer the taxes, move them on over into a better deal. I haven't gotten to the position where I found the need to liquidate to, to make that transition, but there are times beyond that where it does make sense. Like if sure. you fully depreciated a building already, then you got to sell. Then you're yeah. losing too many tax benefits if you don't sell. So there are definitely times, you know, better opportunity or fully depreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. Move the money over and do a 1031. Yeah. Upgrade quality, upgrade units, fully depreciated. Totally agree. Something you'll do. Decades from now, I'm sure when, you know, worst case you depreciate to zero, right? Because exactly 20, 28 and a half years happens to everybody. So, and, and what you just mentioned was actually super valid is upgrade quality. See, I, if I had a bunch of, let's say 1920s properties yeah. right now in Southern California, where we have earthquakes, I'd be interested in possibly getting out of those solely for the fact that I want to I be more resistant to earthquakes and natural disasters and issues by moving up to newer. Yeah, and again, upgrading quality is a great reason, right? Sometimes people get in to markets on, you know, let's just use the 1920 example because they're cute, they got the charm, they have all of that. But when you think as an owner, 
you have to think earthquakes and you have to think retrofit and, and you know, all that other stuff. So yeah, upgrading quality is expensive. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, to say the least, very expensive. All right, so let's finish up the story. So through 2015, you did your 80, 10, 10. You're now in a new home. Uh, mm -hmm. How's the story sort of in through today in 2019? What, what else did you add? Yeah, so uh, then, then in 2016, right during the election, uh, we acquired another property at short sale, had financing issues, and we ended up going in. There's a lot of people like, well, how are you going to finance a building if there are no heaters or, or there are problems or there's mold or something like that? No problem, I said. We just went in, did the work prior to escrow closing, knowing Ooh. that we have a contract. There's a risk to that. But hey, with risk comes reward. So we were able to close a short sale in 2016. And in 2017, we ended up acquiring uh, a commercial building. Oh. Uh, and uh, what did we do? Uh, one more that was supposed to be a flip in uh, Newbury Park that we ended up renovating and turning into a rental property. 2018, we uh, bought what I had called at the time the, the YouTube flip, and that is the only property that I sold, and I give away the secrets as to how that one uh, evolved or devolved uh, in, in the real estate investing course. I talk about that one and sort of break apart where things went well, where things didn't go well. And a short little preview of that is that one of the things or one of the reasons I really hate flipping real estate is basically what happened in 2018. The, the, the spring's doing great, the market's hot, everybody's excited, all of a sudden the Trump tax plan comes into <laughs> effect and interest rates go up to 5% and what happens to the market? Boom, it drops and you're like, wait a minute, I'm doing a flip here and now you drop the market on me? <laughs> you know, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you, this is what I tell people a lot. I, I, wholesalers, which you obviously know the term, they think in days or, or weeks, right? Um, flippers think in months. And when you're a buy and hold guy like us, it's like, ah, it's years and decades, right? We don't, right. We don't let little, you know, Trump tax plans or, you know, a spike, a spike to 5%. I've, I've had loans at 9 and 10%. So right, a spike exactly, to 5 yeah. is like, what are you talking about? Right, but, right. That's pretty cool. So let's, continue on the portfolio, um, where do you see yourself going? You still like the one a year plan for the next decade or so? Or do you, you yeah, kind of I mean, uh, you know, this year, for example, it's it's May and we're already at two this year. We wow. we just put under contract a uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollar house that after fifty k should be worth somewhere around five seventy five to six. Uh, we put a, a, a we closed on a six hundred fifty thousand dollar deal that uh, a model match in a worse location closed for $760,000 two weeks later. Wow. So it, what's, what's kind of interesting, I guess now looking back at sort of the progress, which I hadn't thought of before, so thank you for that, <laughs> is it's okay to start slow. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we get sometimes overly discouraged when we see, oh, you know, here are people killing it and super successful, but it doesn't actually show how slow the start was. Remember when I was first exposed yeah. to real estate, 2009 to first purchase in 11, that's, that's, that takes time, you know? Yeah. And again, that people need to realize that that's okay. Right. I yeah. talked to, I'm sure people in your real estate course, a lot of them have zero rentals and they that's come right. to you because you're the expert. They need to hear guys like you and I who have some say it's okay to invest a year's time figuring it out, but you've got to do the work. The, exactly. the, thing, the thing that I hate is when people say, I just want a deal. I just want a deal. Nah, there's no definition. What, what I think is a deal, what you think, I mean, that, that scares me. And I, and I deal with that on a daily basis as a real estate broker is people will come and, and they'll say, I'm looking to invest uh, money in your area. Let me know when you have a deal. I'm like, yeah. oh, not how it works, <laughs> but okay. And, and then they never end up getting deals, right? Of course. Usually, yeah, 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 it's like frustrating, right? So yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. You usually what I found is the people that end up getting the best deals, ending up with the best deals, are the people that uh, come in. They say, "Okay, I don't own any real estate. Let's have a meeting with real estate brokers. Who can help me find the best real estate broker? Great. Hey, broker, who do you recommend for a lender? Great. You get hooked up with that lender. Great lender. What do I need?" to be able to buy. Let's get all of that stuff taken care of. Let's work together and prepare. Now, 
let's with the real estate agent, once I'm pre-approved, start educating myself on the market. And so you start noticing all of these precursors. It's like, wait a minute, get pre-approved, get your finances in order, get your circle in order, get your team of realtors, contractors, lenders, which a lot of it could start with a good realtor. Absolutely. And, and then educate yourself on the market. And then surprise, surprise, you'll start noticing, ah, oh, that actually looks like a much better deal because I've just seen 50 houses in person. Now I can start identifying that looks like it's probably going to get multiple offers. And those are the people that generally get the best deals. Well, you've just outlined exactly what I tell people when they, when they come to me is you, you really have one job as a real estate investor. And that is to understand what you think a you know, a bad deal, an average deal, a good deal, and a great deal is in your market of choice, whether it's Southern California or Cleveland, Ohio. I don't care where it is. You have to answer that question. And how do you do that? You go see 50 freaking houses. Exactly. <laughs> you need to be able to go, okay, I've seen 50. This is in the top 10%. If you can do that, you've created focus and you ignore the other 90. That, that, People don't get it. That's the magic. If you can just focus on the top 10% after your foundation or your base, you've, you've solved most of the, most of the puzzle. And from there, That's it's a great way to put it because you're also limiting your risk now because you're only focusing on the things that have the most potential. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And you're saving time, right? Because most of the people we talk to have full-time jobs, That's true. Where, you know, 60 hours a week, have family responsibilities. If you can take away 90% of the market, and then, oh, by the way, some of the 10% you're working on is not great, but you'll learn more. This, these two are not good because they're next to a junkyard. I don't know. But right. you, you learn more, and then you just continually refine your list, and pretty soon you're taking your little pieces of time, and you're, you know, I call it return on time, right? Your return on time explodes as you do this more. And that's why 2012 and 13 and 14, and why you're accelerating is because you're getting faster throughput. For you. And that's so true. You know, I think the, the worst kind of investor is exactly the opposite where it's kind of just like, okay, here's 90% of the stuff on the market. Let's just do this with offers. Offer, 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 uh, offer, yeah. offer, 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 offer. <laughs> they're all crap offers. Yeah, it's, it's the <laughs> shotgun approach. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's shotgun no approach. That's right. Well, there's no chance. And here's the deal, right? If somebody said yes, you're not going to know what to do. You still don't have that <laughs> foundation. You're like, what well, happened? Right. You, Oh, this reminds me of a place. This was such a mistake of a listing, but I took this listing. This must have been 2000. Actually, I think it was 2013. 2013. This place was guaranteed worth not a penny more than like 375. And the owners, because they were a referral and uh, the referral source is like, just, just list it. I know it's overpriced. Just list it. We had it on the market for 450, which is like insanely overpriced. And it's nasty on top of that. I mean, like the kitchen's grungy. It's the hoarding mess. It's like the, the kind of deal you don't even want as a wedge because just everything's wrong with it. <laughs> and so I get an offer from one of these spaghetti people at 375. And I think all they were doing was going, all right, every 450 property, just go yeah. under 75K on the price. And so I called the person. I'm like, hey, um, if we accept, uh, you, you know, this, this deal at 375, uh, did you do your research on it to where you actually think you can flip it? Because their thought is, oh yeah, if they get something 75 under, they'll be able to flip it. Yeah. They came back a week later and they're like, yeah, you were right. Actually, we could only afford to pay 300 for that deal because <laughs> it was worth 375 fixed up. Exactly. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, again, lots of, again, some people think it's, it's a volume business. You have to do your homework first. As Kevin said, right? Go look at 50 houses. So you have that foundation. So you can say, okay, the 51st is in the bottom 50% or the top 10, and then only look at the top 10%. Exactly. Um, so that's very, very cool. So again, buy and hold guy, never selling one or two a year going forward. Um, is that just the next, I mean, where do, do you just keep adding? Cause this is a business you can do forever, right? There's it it is. You know, the nice thing about real estate is it, it also gives you these, these, opportunities to make these life choices. And, yes. and this is kind of like deep and big. And, and my opinion is you could, you could evaluate, you know what, at what point is it enough? And at what point do I just say, you know what, take all the positive cash flows, start lopping off principal payments, start paying off properties, and then retire really well off because now you have so much control after 15 years of just paying off properties or whatever. 
and then you're done. Yeah. Or you could stay in the mindset of, well, I'm just going to focus on growth and just keep growing. And that's an option too. And that's just a cool thing that I always think of is, well, as long as I keep enjoying what I'm doing, whether that's making YouTube videos, being a real estate broker, you know, helping people on the live streams in the course, as long as I keep enjoying that, I'll just keep taking whatever money I make and throwing it into real estate investments and acquiring. As soon as I'm not enjoying what I'm doing anymore, hey, I might make that mindset shift and say, you know what, let's just go into payoff phase and call it a day, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Very cool. Well, one question I wanted to make sure I asked is, as you're raising your sons, Max and Jack, yes. um, you know, when do you kind of introduce them to this business? And, um, you know, do you hope they follow in your footsteps and become real estate investors? Or do you want them to go off to college? I mean, have you had that kind of tug and pull as a dad and a real estate investor? Have you thought about that? Yeah, actually, uh, my wife and I, we talk about that a lot. We talk about wanting to establish something large enough, whether it's a company or an investment group or whatever, large enough to where they would feel compelled to, you know, even if they went and worked for somebody else for a little bit, come back and eventually work with the family business. And so we joke that, well, we just need to have six or seven children to increase <laughs> the odds that some of them stay with us. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go have a basketball team, and, and that way, one of the odds say one will come. There you go. Bingo! Hey, somebody's <laughs> gonna end up staying with us. <laughs> so, uh, awesome. and, and I don't mean staying with us in terms of like living in our house right. or whatever. I I mean, like uh, you know, living and working in the same city as us because it's unfortunate. I mean, I see families all the time where, and it, that is the way of the world right now. That's our society. It is what it is. You've got mom and dad in Florida. Kids go off to college in the Northeast. Then they go work in New York. Then they move to Chicago and the other siblings are in Washington or there or there. Or there. It's kind of just the way it is now. But my hope is that <laughs> by building something large enough, I might be able to keep most of my family close. <laughs> Well, there you go. Best wishes for you. Our, our daughter is uh, New York, so I'm one of those parents. Kid that's all right. and, and you know what? And that's the way it is these days. You know, yeah. it's just totally normal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, I am curious, uh, you've, you've taken on the topic of some luminaries, right? Grant Cardone and Gary Vee in some of your videos. Uh, and, and I thought done a very good job of sort of peeling back what they're saying from marketing. You know, I like most of it, but some of it, I'm just curious, it's got to take a lot of guts to sort of put that stuff out there, I would think. Yeah. So, you know, the thing about me is I, I tell myself that I, I want to live a life where I do anything I can to convey the truth. Yep. And if that means, uh, you know, titles with other people's names on it, uh, you know, because I'm specific, because I always get those comments. People are like, oh, well, you're just putting other people's names in your titles. Yeah. But you know what? It's called perspective because to me, life is more than just, you know, here's one guy on a podium blabbing, here's somebody else on a podium blabbing, and, and, and nobody's connecting the dots. Yeah. And if I can come out and say, hey, look, this is where I agree and disagree with this person. I agree and disagree with this person on this. Then to me, the person who benefits isn't necessarily me. It's certainly not them when I'm disagreeing with them. But the people who benefit are the watchers. And to me, I think that's the greatest social good that can be done is helping people connect the dots. So when I see something that I think is wrong, I call it out. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's kudos to you as a person in your show, because you've done a great job. You could, you could literally just plaster their names and get views. That's not what you're doing. I, I've never taken any of your videos like that. They're always pretty well thought out. You do a great job of saying, you know what they do A, B, C, and D well, Here's the rub. When you connect those and then they spin it this way, you know, that's kind of wonky. Right. And um, some of them are, right? They're, they're like, well, that's probably one step too far. Uh, so, I, so I applaud that. I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight that, you know, obviously all of your investments are in Southern California. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both California guys. What about, you know, the Midwest and the South? There's nothing we've talked about that prohibits somebody who lives there doing the same thing, right? That's exactly right. That's great clarity to add, really, because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you're just in this California bubble. Well, no, the principles of owning real estate, the tax benefits, the appreciation, the getting a good deal, the cash flow, all of the things that matter when it comes to identifying a wedge deal apply whether it's 
Indianapolis. I don't care if it's Manhattan. There are wedge deals to be had there. Or, you know, wherever it is, uh, Florida, Texas, it doesn't matter. There are great opportunities to apply the same principles no matter where you are. Where I think people go astray, and, and then this this is, you know, sometimes I, I box myself in by saying this, but I personally think the easiest way to start, it's not necessarily what you always have to do, but I personally think the easiest way to start is where are you living? And start within 30 minutes of that area because that's where you can first become an expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no question. As you'll read in my book, once you read it, uh, I spent a year looking in my neighborhood. So I live in Mountain View, just to put location. Nothing Mountain in the View. Bay, yeah. <laughs> nothing nice. has made sense here. Uh, but we did. We spent a year. Uh, and it was after that year, we, we pulled a California map out and we started drawing circles, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, you know, nine, ultimately two and a half hours was Fresno, California. So our entire portfolio had built, has been built in a city that I had never been to. But I built a team just like you. We spent a year figuring it out, looking at deals, looking at deals. And we went from one house to two to three, same path. And then at the peak, we 1031 and suddenly we owned a bunch of apartments. So nice. Um, Good for yeah. you. Yeah. And I think that's great because you, you tried where oh, you yeah. were and, and you expand that circle kind of like a cat expands their knowledge of a neighborhood. They just keep walking in circles and growing that circle. And, and you keep looking for those opportunities. I think where things get risky is where people are now, okay, uh, you know, you live in one area and it's like, let me go invest. 3,000 miles away and I'll go there maybe once per month and I'm sure everything or once per year is usually what year, people do yeah. with flights, right? Yeah, not once per month. And I'll go there once per year and I'm sure everything will work out in the meantime because I'll have a manager and I'll have people doing it. Unless you have a reasonable way to constantly check in, I wouldn't have such high expectations of other people. <laughs> yeah, no, totally agree. Actually, I just put out a video today or I actually may go out tomorrow that um, I'm seeing a lot of similarities between 2019 and 2007, oh, which is okay. not a good thing. No, not at all. 2007 on paper was still a good year. Yeah. Like 2008 was when it rolled over, but that's not good, right? The herd, especially in California, and actually I called it dumb money, yeah. is out-of-state investing is the, the new topic. Oh, I have three different cities and 12 different houses, and they're all 50K. People, the business cycle is real. We have 4% unemployment. What happened the last time in that area when it went to nine? Hint, look from 2007 to 2010. It wasn't pretty. And, and people are going to get crushed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so true. It's something where it's so important to uh, really recognize you know, th there are legitimate downsides to investing in real estate if you don't have the right education and the right circle. And I'm not saying it's hard to get that. No. But like you mentioned earlier, to start with, just give me a good deal and buy anything, I, I think totally misappropriates the success that people have in real estate. Most success starts with the right education, having the right people around, and then having the time to actually follow through on your investments. And that sounds like it's exactly what you were able to do. Absolutely. So let's talk about your course, because again, I think identifying a wedge deal is a skill that can be learned, and it should be learned from somebody who's proven it like yourself. So please tell us about your course, where it is, where it's at, all the good stuff in it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's at meetkevin.teachable.com. And so what we have is we have the real estate investing course, which is by far the most popular. We also have a course for real estate agents because mm -hmm. I always thought that if somebody was going to be a good real estate agent, they should learn how to invest and then market the knowledge that they have in investing as a real estate agent. And they'd be they'd have as many clients as they'd want to have. <laughs> At least that was true for me. So, but the big thing is the real estate investing course. And that's where I just put my entire 10 years of knowledge out in the form of video lectures. But I then also dialogue with all the course members twice a week on private live streams where I help them analyze deals where I'll screen, I'll show share my screen with them and I'll look and people always send me deals that I call yeah butts as well sometimes. <laughs> and I'll explain yeah. that for you. People send me things they're like, Hey, you know, I found this, what looks like a good wedge deal. Uh, it's great because of this, but it's uh, in a little bit of a higher crime area. And it's great because of this, but it's right next to a church. And then I'm like, wait, you're literally defining what a yeah, but is <laughs> like, don't buy something where you have to go. This is great, but <laughs> you know, it should be 
this is great. <laughs> so, yeah. And helping people identify that is very real because that's what I do as a real estate broker. I'm like, are you sure you want to buy that? Because that's kind of weird. Uh, I do the same thing in the course. Yeah. And back to your real estate agent comment. I, I've always thought, because um, again, let's be clear. I, as you'll see in the book, I bought everything out of the MLS for 15 years. Yeah. Never direct marketed, didn't have bird dogs, right? Didn't, I didn't live in the city, right? And I traveled all over the world for my job. So the MLS was all I had. And it's not even the real MLS as you know it. It's like realtor.com and Redfin, right? So it's, sure. it's fed. Uh, but where I was going with this is if real estate agents can figure out how investors think, not only do they get as many you know, buyers, but they get repeat buyers, which are the ones you want, right? right? And I think that's mostly what people are looking for as an investor is somebody that they can say, look, here's the scoop. This is how much money I have. These are my goals. Can you help me connect the dots? And unfortunately, most real estate agents can't. They say, well, here's a list of stuff. Let me yeah. know what you want to make an offer on. Uh, I, I, uh, great. That's not what we're looking for, right? What we're looking for is, uh, even, and even if a buyer comes up with it, like, Hey, is this a good deal? You want that real estate agent that goes, you know, I don't think that's a good deal because of X, Y, Z, but you know what? This came up, this could be a good deal because it matches what you're looking to do. I've already talked to the agent. I know what offers there are. I know how we can win the deal. Let's see if this makes sense for you. Somebody that's an advisor will never run out of clients. No, I agree. And that's why I think real estate agents should take a look at your course because as a frequent buyer, right, I've done 10 or 11 transactions this year already. Um, there are not many real estate agents that do what you've said, right? I can't tell you how many meetups I go to and tell our story and agents are always trying to reach out to me and they go, well, well here's, here's a zip code. Here's everything in it. Well, I'm like, I could get that today. I mean, how's that helpful, right? Give me your opinion at least. Tell me that number three on this list is the best because A, B, and C. Now we can have a discussion, right? Because maybe I disagree, maybe I agree, but don't just send me a blank list. That's, that, that's not helpful. Bingo. I couldn't agree more. The, the blank list without uh, that advising nature gets you nowhere. <laughs> exactly. So I, I was curious, I wanted to ask you this. Now that you are clearly successful uh, on all, if not on all fronts, what would you tell your senior year high school self? In, in, anything? Golly. Yeah. I mean, if, if I could talk to my senior year self, I would have, uh, I, I would probably the one thing I could change is if I went back is figured out how to make more money sooner, uh, uh -huh. rather than going to Jamba juice, because that would have enabled me to buy even more real estate at essentially the bottom. Right. Right. Uh, it, and so I think there are a lot of high schoolers that, uh, watch YouTube videos or even college kids and, and, it's so dreamy to think, oh yeah, I'll just have passive income by making a YouTube channel or I'll put some affiliate links, uh, you know, send those out to my friends and I'm going to have passive income and I'll be living on a beach soon. Yet it's, it kind of takes away step one, which is you kind of need to go work to make some money and, and then you want to figure out the right and best places to invest it. And that's where that famous saying comes from, you know, it takes money to make money. It doesn't have to be a lot. But zero usually ain't going to help you start. So if I could have made more money in high school doing, say, door-to-door -door sales or something other than selling smoothies at Jamba Juice, that's what I would have done. Yeah, and there's the key right there, right? There's nothing wrong with hustling a nine-to-five job, maybe commission-based, so that you can make that money. Earn, save, invest, right? Kind of repeat going forward. Um, the one thing that I never heard in your story, but I sense it's there is you've, you've always been comfortable understanding what a need versus a want is, right? Because you've lived conservatively, you've lived below your means, and hey, saving six grand at Jamba Juice, I'm sure wasn't easy. Um, this is very, very true. It's, it's something where, uh, this was, I actually have to thank my father-in-law for it, and maybe I should talk about that more, but it was this concept of, oh, guns versus butter. So anytime I'd say something like, I'm gonna buy this beach cruiser bike, there's always my father-in-law going, is that a gun or is it a butter item? And, and basically a gun was something that produced income and butter was just any bit of crap that you buy that loses half of its value day one and you're just getting it because you want it. Look, we get free headphones with our iPhone, right? But this 
is nothing but a butter item. It's, yep. you know, now it happened to be from an Apple gift card, so I don't feel as bad. But let's say you come out of pocket, you know, 300 bucks for some Beats headphones. Why? You're getting the same thing and your ears don't know the freaking difference. Now, I mean, I might upset some audiophiles there, but I'd rather have, uh, uh, you know, my money going into real estate. And I think that guns versus butter mentality really helped me uh, distinguish that. Well, that, again, that was a gift that you've been given. I mean, I wasted my entire 20s earning a decent income, but I had nothing to show for it. No savings, nothing. I had a couple of nice Beats headphones or there's, you know, similar things like that. I had stuff. Yeah. Right. I had butter uh, in your analogy. But people, people need to hear that it's okay to live on less. That's what I think a lot of this social media and Facebook and Instagram posts. It's all butter, man. It's just fucking stop it and, and be okay. So you can invest in real estate. They'll take, you, take, take care of you forever. Would you agree? It's so true. It, it's so true. There's, I mean, every time you open up your phone, there's a new ad. You know what? You, you, you see this regular outlet you have? Well, you need some lights <laughs> shining out beneath it because it'll make your kitchen look cooler. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Sacrifice now so you can get whatever you all want later. There you uh, go. A fun question I had for you if we had time, which we do, is What's your ideal vacation look like? Where, where would you go? No YouTube, no nothing, just you and your family. Where would, where would Kevin go? Yeah, you know, I think uh, the ideal vacation is, uh, and this might maybe sounds weird, but it's honestly, it's, it's a mental state because oh. I, I've been to Paris uh, three times. Uh, the, uh, the, the first time I went, I was focused on, uh, you know, real estate. I'm a new real estate agent. Oh, we're going to, you, you know, uh, get deals and help people close deals. Uh, the, the second time I went was surrounded with this idea of, okay, I'm going to make uh, all this new marketing for my business. I'm going to do videos. I'm going to do this, that, and all, all this other stuff. It was always work, 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 right? And this was supposed to be a vacation. And it wasn't until the last time I went to Paris, which I was actually, it was in college. It was my last year of college and it was for some political science credits to get my degree. And my father-in-law took over my entire business and I went to Paris with nothing to do. Literally nothing to do. No phone. I left the phone in the room all the time. It was just, let me wander out. You know what? I feel like a croissant right now. <laughs> it, to me, that is by far will always go down as the happiest point in my life where I could literally just, there's no message. There's no nothing. Wow. So that's why I say it's not necessarily it's the destination. It's what, what baggage are you bringing with you where you're like going? It. And if you could bring nothing, that's when I'm happiest. Very, very cool. I love that. I, I think that's, I never heard that answer, but it is probably the best answer I've, I've ever heard. So that, that's no, awesome. <laughs> Well, as we wrap this up, I want to make sure I turn it over to you because you have so much to provide. Uh, why don't you share with everything and make sure you hit uh, the I'm over it tour. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, that's probably the coolest thing uh, is, uh, you know, in addition to obviously the real estate investing course, or you can follow me obviously on YouTube or Instagram at meet Kevin. Uh, the, the biggest thing is you know, a lot of people to get started or to get to the next level in real estate investing or just finance in general, YouTube videos aren't going to cut it because once you watch the YouTube video, you get excited for 20 minutes and then you go have a hamburger and everything you know, is out the window. And so that's where I got inspired to do this, this I'm over it too. I'm over you know, the videos and the rah, 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 but nobody actually putting things into practice. And I, I thought if I go to 13 places over the next 13 months and in one day just have an event where I can meet people and figure out what's stopping them from getting to the next level and maybe just maybe give them the motivation and the knowledge they need to get over that bridge, that's going to make me feel really great about myself and what I'm able to provide people. That's awesome. Well, well, Kevin, this has been so much fun. Uh, I try not to fanboy too much, so hopefully I did okay there because uh, you're somebody you're I look great. at every day. And uh, I appreciate you giving me some time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yep.